So far, we've mainly thought about choices people make in economic environments where they are small relative to that economic environment. By being small, we mean that nothing the person can do can actually affect the economic environment in which they operate. In perfectly competitive markets, for instance, both consumers and firms are small relative to the size of the market. That means that nothing that they can do can actually impact the prices that they face. So in those environments, there's no reason to think about how people might behave strategically, where by strategic behavior we mean behavior that's aimed at changing the economic environment in which we operate. But as we become large relative to our economic environment, our actions might be able to impact that environment. And so we begin to have an incentive to think strategically. Now the primary tool that we use to analyze strategic decision making is game theory. And to begin, we have to think about what do we actually mean by a game? A game basically has five components that need to be specified before we can analyze the game. The first component is that we need to know who are the players in the game. Suppose, for example, that we want to model the interaction between an employer and a job applicant as a game. In that case, we have two players, the employer and the job applicant. The second thing we have to specify is what actions can the players take. In our example, the employer can offer a wage. The job applicant can choose to accept or reject that wage. So notice that the actions come in very different forms for the two players in this case. The employer can choose among a whole continuum of possible wages to offer. So the space of possible actions is a whole continuum whereas the job applicant can only choose from two possible actions, either accept or reject the offer. The third thing we have to specify is what we call the sequence of the game. So by the sequence we mean, do some players get to move first, or do all the players move simultaneously? So this allows us to distinguish between two types of games that we'll think about. Games that we'll call simultaneous move games and games we're going to call sequential move games. So our example of the employer and the job applicant is a sequential move game. The employer moves first and offers a wage and then the employee decides whether to accept or reject that wage after observing it. The fourth component of the game is that we need to know what the payoffs are in the game. At the end of the game, depending on how the game is played, what does each player get? What is their payoff? And then finally, we need to specify what information people have about other people's payoffs. Each player understands what the payoff at the end of the game is for that player, but do they also understand what the payoffs are for the other players? That creates another distinction between different types of games. They are what we call complete information games and incomplete information games. So incomplete information games are games where players are uncertain about what the end of the game means to other players, whereas complete information games are games where each player knows what the end of the game means to other players depending on how the game was played. So let's give a few examples. Suppose we think about the game that kids play, rock, paper, scissors. So kids simultaneously have to either play rock, paper, or scissors. So it's a simultaneous move game. And everybody knows what the end of the game means. Everybody knows that uh, paper beats rock and so forth. So everybody understands what the end of the game means to other players depending on how the game is played. We have complete information. So rock, paper, scissors is a simultaneous move game 
people make their move at the same time without knowing what other players are doing. And it's a complete information game in the sense that everybody understands what the outcome of the game means to everybody else. Compare that to the game of chess. In the game of chess, everybody understands who wins the game and who loses the game depending on how the game was played. So we have complete information about what the payoffs in the game mean to other players. But we're moving sequentially. White gets to move first, black moves next, and then they alternate. So it's a sequential move game that's also a complete information game. Now think about an art auction, the kind of auction where everybody submits a sealed bid in an envelope without knowing what other people are doing. That's a simultaneous move game. But it's a game where we may know what the piece of art means to us, but we are not sure about what it means to other people, how they value that piece of art. So in that case, we have incomplete information about what the payoffs are for other players. We only know what the payoffs mean to us. We may have beliefs about what other people's payoffs mean to them, but we don't know for sure. So a sealed bid auction is an example of a simultaneous move games. Everybody submits their bid at the same time without knowing what other people's bids are. But we have incomplete information about what that piece of art means to other people. Compare that to what's called an ascending bid auction. That's the kind of auction where the auctioneer stands in front of the room and starts with a low price for the piece of art, sees if, if anyone's willing to pay that price, and then allows people to bid higher and higher with the game ending when no one else bids and the highest bid wins the piece of art. So that's called an ascending bid auction. People still don't know what that piece of art means to other people. They only know what it means to themselves. So they have incomplete information about what the payoffs mean to other people. But it's a sequential game because we get to move in sequence. We get to observe what other people do and decide, do we submit another bid or do we stop bidding for the piece of art? So these are the basic kinds of games. Simultaneous move, sequential move, complete information and incomplete information that game theorists think about. Now in this class, we're not going to think about incomplete information games. Games where you don't know what the payoffs mean to other people and you just have to form beliefs about what it means to other people to have different outcomes of the game. We're going to focus on complete information games where everybody understands what the payoffs are both for themselves and for other people depending on how the game was played. We'll leave incomplete information to a future game theory class. But we are going to talk about simultaneous move games and sequential move games. People were, uh, games where people play at the same time without knowing what other people have done and games where people move in sequence.